Back in 2010, when President Obama signed the Affordable Care Act into law, health policy dreamers had high hopes that it would lead the nation to near universal insurance coverage. California's political leaders embraced this vision. California's exchange will help millions of uninsured Californians to provide more preventative health care to people, to make sure that people have insurance. And nobody will be denied because of a pre-existing condition. And there's a strong case to make that the Golden State reflects the law at its best. The uninsured rate has dropped to 6%, and more than two-thirds of ACA consumers can find a plan this year for 10 bucks a month. The success is thanks in part to Peter Lee, who runs the state's ACA exchange covered California. Lee is expected to step down in March. So today, an exit interview with a man who sees the strengths and weaknesses of the ACA and what it may take to finally reach universal coverage. From the studio at the Leonard Davis Institute at the University of Pennsylvania, I'm Dan Gorenstein. This is Tradeoffs. Peter Lee was born to be in healthcare. President Truman appointed Peter's grandfather to help sketch out a national health plan in the 40s. President Johnson tapped Peter's uncle to help create Medicare. All told, Peter's father, his three uncles, and aunt all were physicians. Peter laughs, remembering when his grandfather cornered him in college. He assaulted me with the, uh, why wasn't I becoming a doctor? And even then, I said I could probably do more for health care through policy than through being a doc. A good line to brush back his grandfather, but at Berkeley, Peter did find himself running in policy circles. But his interest in healthcare really kicked in after he saw the healthcare system fail so many people he knew in the mid 80s. Seeing the AIDS epidemic sweeping through my community as a gay man and seeing people die in the face of government inaction, I saw some of the best and brightest people truly of a generation die. Peter became an AIDS activist. He moved to Washington, D.C., where he got arrested for demonstrating outside the White House. He spent the next 20 years working for a variety of nonprofits, including the Pacific Business Group on Health, hoping to improve health care. All that led him back to Washington, where then-President Obama asked him to join the team. When I was interviewed and screened, I had to answer if I'd ever been arrested. I was sort of proud to say, well, yeah, on the other side of the fence from the White House, I was arrested. And now I'm looking to come on this side of the fence that's actually expanded health care coverage. And uh, I love the irony, but so much of what we're dealing with today is similar. Disparities in health care. We've done a lot better, but some of the lessons of my being an AIDS activist carry through to today. To appreciate what Peter's learned about the ACA, it helps to outline what the ACA has done. Big picture, it aimed for all Americans to have affordable health insurance. To that end, the law expanded Medicaid, the public health insurance program for low-income Americans. As of today, all but 12 states have done so. And the federal government offers subsidies to help cover monthly insurance premiums. People who make up to about four times the federal poverty limit, that's $106,000 for a family of four, are eligible. Generally, you qualify if you earn too much for Medicaid, are too young for Medicare, or are not offered insurance at work. This is where Peter comes in. People with these subsidies shop for coverage online at what are called exchanges or marketplaces. Peter, for the last decade, has run California's, which is called Covered California. So, Peter, I'd like you to take us back to 2013. Can you set the scene and describe your goals? So, in 2013, about 17% of Californians went insured. Now, we ran the numbers. About 5 million of those were eligible for Medicaid. Great. A little over 2 million eligible for our financial subsidies. Our job was to get every one of them signed up because the secret sauce of making the Affordable Care Act work in a sustainable way is to do outreach so people that maybe they want insurance, but they need a nudge. They need a reminder. Every year, we have 40% of our people turn over. They go back into the workforce or they lose a job and they need insurance coverage and they make a little too much money for Medicaid. 
the way you make a market work is provide stability and certainty for the insurers and good benefit designs with good networks for the consumers. That may sound simple, but to get there, you needed insurers to buy in. And what you were pitching them was pretty different, right? Pre-ACA insurance companies offered a real variety of plans with all kinds of benefits, making it difficult to shop from one plan to the next. You wanted companies to sell the exact same plan. The only difference would be what doctors and hospitals were included and, of course, the price. So how would that first meeting go? We laid out to the plans is this is a good business opportunity for you. We're going to give you a way to make money, but not too much. We're going to give you the platform of accessing two and a half million people that have subsidies. And we're going to put gas in the tank with a big spend on marketing. But in doing that, we also told them that these consumers are really price sensitive. So you need to recognize you're going to be competing for lives, but not on your terms, on our terms. So one way you got the insurers to play along was by promising them a bunch of customers and a lot of people buy plans every year. So that makes the insurers happy. You also delivered on that promise of putting gas in the tank. Covered California spent like $290 million on marketing in that first year and has spent at least a hundred million every year since. Today, Peter, you guys publish materials in 15 different languages, but yet here's the thing. And I know you know this, according to Berkeley's labor center, some 3.2 million Californians remain uninsured this year. Is this a failure of marketing, Peter? Yeah, a couple things. Uh, really, uh, when you look at California, the biggest reduction of the uninsured has come from the expansion of Medicaid, not from Cover California. So about one in three Californians now has Medi-Cal, which is the uh, Medicaid program in the state of California. Now, many of those knocked on the door of the Medicaid department because of our marketing. Hallelujah. They come to us, we send them to Medi-Cal. That's great. But look at that 6% remaining uninsured. Um, about 60% of them are undocumented. They are not eligible for financial help. At all. So what you're saying is a lot of people who are uninsured in the state are not eligible for subsidies through the ACA or Medi-Cal, the state's Medicaid insurance program, because they're undocumented. Now, California's governor has recently unveiled a plan that would grant all undocumented Californians access to Medi-Cal if they qualify financially. But Peter, you've done all the spending on the marketing and there's still more than a million people uninsured. What do you think's driving that? I've actually gotten a postdoc degree now in marketing because I've learned this and now I've spent about a billion dollars in marketing. But part of learning that was focus groups. I'll tell you, one of the focus groups I remember well, um, there was a guy that was saying, yeah, I know what, uh, how cheap healthcare would be. I know I could get health insurance for $100 a month, but I'll probably do it when I pay off my pickup truck. And he was making a real life choice. He wants health insurance. The secret sauce isn't, it's marketing in part, but marketing supported by affordability. You've got to do marketing because people move in and out of coverage, but you've got to have true financial help that is meaningful for lower income people that the ACA did part way there, but not enough. The American Rescue Plan is actually taking the next big steps, I think, to actually round out where the ACA started. The American Rescue Plan, passed by Congress in 2021, expanded who was eligible for ACA subsidies and made the subsidies more generous. In California, that meant about two thirds of covered California enrollees could get plans for about 10 bucks a month. And Peter, as you said, people aren't going to buy these plans unless they're cheap, but somebody's got to pay. And right now that's the federal government, really taxpayers. Do you think this is the most effective, efficient way to get the U.S. closer to universal coverage? Given where we are today, absolutely. 
Health care in America is too expensive for anyone to pay for on their own. The nominal increased spending that we're doing to help uh, 15 million Americans have affordable coverage is part of what we need to do as a nation to actually step up and reach towards universal coverage with the tools we have, which are Medicaid expansion and marketplace subsidies. If you want to start from scratch, then let's pretend we're in 1920 England and we'd have a system that may be somewhat more efficient. The Affordable Care Act builds on an existing patchwork system and in doing that, can do it effectively if it's run well. When we come back, Peter Lee talks about the strengths and weaknesses of the ACA and what ACA 2.0 may look like. Welcome back. We're talking with Peter Lee, the first executive director of Covered California, the state's ACA exchange. Peter is expected to step down in March. So, Peter, you've talked a lot about doing more to hold health plans insurers accountable. Back when you started at Covered California, you said a big part of the goal was to ensure that people got access to quality care. And you've recently announced a plan where, starting next year, insurers will be at risk for up to 4% of their premium if enough patients fail to meet certain quality standards. How is this going to work? Like, what are the mechanics? So the the mechanics are, and this is really important, it's, it's that first, we picked a focused set of things that matter. Diabetes, hypertension, cancer, and children's immunization. Second, with that focus, we aligned with Medi-Cal in California, the Medicaid program, and CalPERS, the state purchaser. We represent 42% of Californians, which means health plans that choose not to listen and choose not to work to improve health care are not going to be talking to us. They're going to be talking to Wall Street. They're going to be talking to every investor that says, why are you spending hundreds of millions of dollars by writing checks to folks like Cover California, instead of doing what you should have done in the first place, improve healthcare quality. And why did it take so long for Covered California to get here? Like, why is this only happening now? I love that question because look, for 25 years, I've been working on healthcare quality. We've been looking at pay for performance at doctors, medical groups, hospitals. What we've never done is held health plans accountable. Health plans are supposed to be responsible for populations. We know they can be. In California, Kaiser Permanente is in the 90th percentile nationally of delivering high quality care. The rest of our plans, all over the place. We're saying let's change the terms and hold health plans accountable. And we think that's something that we probably should have done more, even though we've got the best contract out there from six years ago, but we didn't put financial teeth in what we're doing. There are now going to be big financial incentives that we think will get health plans' attention. And I hope this gets the attention of other Medicaid programs, of the federal government, uh, of employers. Because we are at fault as much as the health plans are for allowing them to continue to, in theory, take care of populations, when in fact, they've allowed poor quality to continue for 20 years. Peter, As we discuss some of the shortcomings of the ACA, you've mentioned that uh, more generous subsidies, like the ones we've seen from the Biden administration, uh, and holding insurers accountable for health outcomes uh, are two examples of ways we can take the law to the next level, ACA 2.0. Are there any other changes you would make to this law? The Affordable Care Act worked with a patchwork system and addressed part of that system. We have many more people covered, but what we don't have is a way that we've addressed the many people that have employer coverage, which is lousy coverage for low-income people. One of the things the Affordable Care Act 2.0 should do is to make sure that every American gets access to meaningful affordable coverage. Now, does that mean you can opt out of employer coverage into a marketplace? Maybe. If we don't allow people to opt out of employer coverage, make employer coverage better. Those are the two paths forward to actually have 
universal coverage or towards universal coverage that's meaningful for all Americans. This makes me think of those concerns you had back in the 80s and vowed to fight the disparities and barriers to equitable health care for all people. As you've pointed out, those fights continue. Would you say that progress has actually been made? What we have done through the Affordable Care Act is fundamentally address pieces of economic and health inequality. More people have coverage. That coverage means they've got more money to spend on child care. That coverage means that guy I talked about who said, I may get coverage when I can pay off my truck. He's now got a little bit more money to pay off his truck sooner. And so the coverage expansion driven by the Affordable Care Act in California, going from 17 to 6 percent, that is about 6 million Californians that are not only in a better place in their healthcare world, but in their economic world, which bodes well for their children, for their future. So absolutely, the Affordable Care Act made big steps in uh, moving us to be a more just and healthier nation. Peter says his time with Covered California has been the point in his career where he feels he's had the most impact. When he remembers about his health care birthright, he thinks he got it right when he told his grandfather he felt like he could achieve more through policy than being an actual physician. Those days of protesting and organizing back in the 80s set the foundation for his life mission of providing services to more people. You know, there are a lot of people that aren't with us today that died in the AIDS epidemic. I could have made career paths to make money. I could have made career paths in any direction. But sort of saying, when you think about who we've lost and what you can do with your life, boy, I'd rather do a life of service. Is America great today? We're a mixed bag. Are we better today because of the Affordable Care Act making us a more just nation? Absolutely. And it is great to have been a part of that. I'm Dan Gorenstein, and this is Tradeoffs. Doctors aren't trained to be thorough. If something seems wrong, they can always order another test. But sometimes a single test can open the floodgates to unnecessary care. Every once in a while, just like you can win the lottery, you can be the person that it finds cancer and that it could save your life. But there is a better chance that it's going to harm you and that it's going to cost a lot of money. The challenges of cascades of care next time on Tradeoffs. If you enjoyed today's episode of Tradeoffs, don't keep it to yourself. Tell someone else about it. Friend, colleague, family member. Better still, leave a rating or a review wherever you subscribe to us. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube. We're in all the places. The Tradeoffs team is producers Andrea Perdomo and Ryan Levy, Executive Director Jessica Silverman, Communications Manager Nora Tahiri, Senior Health Policy Editor Sarah Thomas, Sound Designer Andrew Perella, Executive Editor Dan Gorenstein, and Senior Producer Leslie Walker. The Tradeoffs theme song was composed by Ty Sitterman with additional music this episode from Blue Dot Sessions and Epidemic Sound. Thanks also to all our listeners who helped support our work, including Amy Blunk, Lori Fiber, David and Debbie Gorenstein, and Michael Chernew. Tradeoffs is supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Arnold Ventures, West Health, the Better Care Playbook, the Leonard Davis Institute of Health Economics at the University of Pennsylvania, the Sozose Foundation, and the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation. The views expressed in this episode are those of the individuals and not those of trade-off staff, advisors, or funders.